Hi, and welcome to Lifestyle Business. I'm Ann. And I'm Chris. And we've got a great show today. Um, we are delighted to have our friend, Aaron Thomas from Accelerator for America to join us. But first, it's a special day for us. We are- It's very special. So special. We're on vacation. Doesn't it look like it? We love spending our vacation with you. <laughs> you are the one thing we're doing this week because it took us a long time to hook that Aaron Thomas from Accelerator for America. I mean, literally. We had Mayor Landrew, we had Mars Morial, we have Michael Tubbs, and finally, we got Aaron Thomas to say yes. So the show must go on. The show must go on. So right. we are here, but we are um, having a staycation this week. Well, I, I, I think some other people might be too. Hopefully, everybody had a great Fourth of July weekend. That's right. And um, happy Kansas Day. Uh, hung out in the backyard making burgers and dogs with your family and uh not too many friends hopefully hopefully <laughs> no fireworks no, no fireworks. big parties it was no, all no. kids it was all kids uh, but it was so good you know yeah. what we've talked we've talked before about uh during this time it's hard um uh, you know it feels like you're on the the train and it's hard to get a day off and we have been talking about the notion of actually taking vacation and taking a break takes discipline mm -hmm. so what we did was, uh, it was funny, we just flipped the switch. Yeah, it's been somewhat easy not to work. I know. <laughs> All right, well, we're back at it today. Yeah, but yeah. it is important, I think, during this time, uh, we have, we're just commenting today on our team call that there's a lot at the surface, um, and so we just have to, you know, be, you know, recognize other people. And last week, we, we met with our member, many of our members on the show, Member Magic. That was fun, so. hearing what they're doing, uh, how they're uh, pivot or persevere, working through it. Mm. Um, uh, you know, our, our Stockton member uh, who has been very um, uh, active, completely virtualizing all of their CPR training. Yeah. Um, and really an inspiration in Stockton's. I mean, it, 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 it was actually really inspiring to me to hear everything that how Everybody hard everybody's doing, doing to, to, to make it through. To just uh, try and survive. Exactly. Well, it also was interesting. We had uh, members from every one of our locations, as you guys know. And I'm apparently having an allergy attack. <laughs> but uh, it was pretty cool. We had a real diverse set of members on. Um, and, you know, at the beginning, you're like, how is this all going to work together, right? Because as we all know, diverse and inclusive is about a lot of times that launch pad, the types of businesses that people are in. So you're like, okay, how are we going to put all these pieces together? And actually, um, it was pretty interesting. I don't think, I wouldn't say it was like the smoothest of the beginning as we're starting to kind of understand how to make that work. But by the end, everybody looked like they sort of had had a little bit of a therapy session and um, were able to walk away with some sort of insights from each other. I thought that was really cool. Everyone was so different, but yet had something to share. Yeah, we've we've talked about uh, what we sometimes call founders therapy, which um, typically happens in person uh, at launchpad locations, often over a beer, uh, maybe after a long day or after as we said a win or a loss or something to celebrate. But it's that empathy we get from each other and our members and a sense of community. And, um, you know, it it's, was nice. I mean, it was nice for me, not just be in broadcast mode, which we're often in, or interviewing, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, um, but to be hearing members talking to each other and supporting yeah. each other, um, that actually felt good again, because um, our members are magic and, and we miss them, right? right? And that's one of the things that the platform as everybody knows, right? You've got member-led and member-driven. It's really important for us. Um, anyway, so that was pretty, that was pretty good. The other interesting thing around that was just kind of how much community matters. And, and I think we often forget that community is not what you're working on. It's actually who you're working around. And that might be virtual and it might be in person, but, you know, we just had somebody, uh, who came to Black Tech Nola last week, which was hosted in New Orleans. Yep. At Launchpad. At Launchpad. And uh, they won the competition for a free permanent, permanent desk. desk. 
yeah. juicy competition. <laughs> but they basically were like, we've been looking for an inclusive and community-driven space. And so now they want to sign up. Yeah. Um, so hopefully we can close that one. On <laughs> you. I hope so too. Um, no, but it's been interesting. And I think it took me back to um, how important it is that we have to actually look out for each other. And we have to look out for members and we have to help people. And it sort of took me back to that sort of mark conversation that we we're having with Morial. Yeah. Um, and around kind of the idea that I think there's a lot of models out there that exist, and I'm going to switch gears here to investment. Um, and I think there's a lot of models that exist that are based on, you know, there's revenue based financing, there's SBA loans, there's high price um, payday loans, and there's also venture capital. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to put any of them on a spectrum there, but <laughs> I think one of the things that we were chatting about is like, they're actually, we actually have to think about differently about the kinds of businesses and what they need for wealth creation um, and how we create and drive capital strategies. And this is why it's great that Aaron's on, um, drive stra strategies into communities. Well, one of the things, um, and uh, we'll, we'll indulge ourselves by talking about our tweets on, on the Lance, show. We're Lance but we, we, um, we tweeted last week that um, unicorns, which is what so much of the uh, Media, uh, startup media, small, you know, business NBCs. In, is is about unicorns um, and creating, you know, these phenomenally successful Uber, you know, Uber, Facebook, et cetera, type of businesses. And as Bruce Gatz said when he was on um, about the need for small business, Main Street regenerators, he called them. Um, you know, I think our, our focus is increasingly on what we call llamas uh, instead of unicorns, uh, which are which are lifestyle businesses um, or small businesses that um, create wealth, create generational wealth. Um, the only difference is if you subtract out the creating exponential returns for VCs, um, you know, most unicorns create also generational wealth, you know, tens of millions of dollars for the founders, that kind of thing. Uh, very similar to llamas that also create tens of millions of dollars. Do they? I'm, I'm, I, when they're someday uh, at maybe. some point. Um, um, but actually, the benefit of llamas is they're not just about sort of that. The zebra debate too is interesting, right? But with the llama, it's more about you know being able to work and create agency. Mm -hmm. And um, some folks on our team, uh, I'm picking on David who basically he is like, I just, I have a bunch of, of jobs. He's always sort of thinking about, you know, what is his entrepreneurial journey? And one of his jobs happens to be today helping us out in Newark. Um, but he's also doing a bunch of other things and starting his own pieces. And I think that, that to me is the definition of llama. Yeah. Right. You run and, and are in charge of your own destiny. Yeah. All right. So he got us fired up about creating wealth, coming up with new capital strategies. So let's bring our friend on uh, from Aaron Thomas from Accelerator for America, because I, what I love about what Aaron Thomas and Accelerator does is they think they help cities. I'm going to get wrong, Aaron, but they help cities think proactively about their capital strategy and investment and entrepreneurship. And so now, without further ado, Aaron Thomas is the Director of Economic Development at Accelerator for America, where he works to find and develop solutions to economic insecurity and provides local communities with tools, technical assistance, and access to capital that creates wealth for existing men residents. How are you? Hey, Anne. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's so good to see you guys. I missed my quarterly meetup with you. I know, so I know. We're, we're over for a big hug, which we're not allowed to have right now, but we can do it virtually. Are you yeah. down in LA? I'm down in LA. Greetings from Los Angeles. Yeah, you guys are having a having <laughs> not a the best time. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's part of the the, the our program for talking about, but I have thoughts. So <laughs> yeah. uh, it can be. This yeah. uh, it can be. We we start a lot of our programs with talking about the hey, about how are thoughts. you? And then uh, <laughs> how's, how's the COVID going? <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. <that's> <laughs> Funny enough, the last place that I was before we all shut down was uh, in New Orleans. Right? That was really? Us last too? Flight was, uh, was New Orleans right before, basically. I think I got back to New Orleans on March 3rd. And then by that time, we were, you know, 
I think March 11th was our last day in the office. Yeah. Well, we just missed you because we flew back uh, a couple days before that. We were down there for Mardi Gras. Oh, cool. <laughs> it, it was cool at the time. <laughs> we felt like we might have dodged a bullet afterwards. Well, exactly. But it's it's yeah. it's nice to have done something before this moment in our lives, right? Like that's we, right. You know? yeah. That's right. It's always the last your last normal day. But yeah, we um we came back on the Saturday of Mardi Gras, and I think both of us were like, "Oh, that was a good move." Yeah. I mean, it's a good move just in general, but. Right. It was a really good move this year. So right. we're glad to be back. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we're bummed to see the numbers rise for sure. Um, I think we've, I think everybody's been running the, you know, the hundred day marathon thinking that was it. And I think we're, right. we're in store for a lot more um, time wise and all that kind of stuff. But as we uh, sort of start to stabilize, I'm excited to hear what you've got going on. Um, you guys have had a few new programs launch. Um, yeah. So why don't you tell me a little bit about what you work on at Accelerator and um, we can dig into some of the things that you're doing. Sure. So I, I guess, is it useful just to give kind of a, a overview of who we are and how we think about things and what we do and all that kind of stuff? So um, Accelerator for America was founded, I think, about three years ago by Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles and Rick Jacobs, who's our CEO. Um, the, the hypothesis behind our founding was that the federal government was leaving cities behind, but there was a lot of really interesting things coming out of cities. And then the goal of our organization was to kind of help scale and replicate those things in cities. So if something really interesting is happening in New Orleans and Memphis and Newark and maybe potentially other places, how do you help them um, go to places that need them as an example, right? Um, and so we, um, we are governed by an advisory council, quote unquote, of um, of mostly local leaders, so mayors, uh, mostly, you know, Mayor Garcetti is, I think, the people that he really believes in and trusts nationally, um, and labor leaders, NGO leaders, business leaders, et cetera, et cetera, um, with the goal of the broader thing is, you know, our broader mandate is, is solutions in cities that are helping with economic insecurity. Um, we work specifically on two soon to be three different kind of planks of work. So one is transit and infrastructure, which started out of Measure M in Los Angeles, which Rick, our CEO, ran and, and Charlotte, who, who works with me there, also helped run and Yousef as well um, to try to help cities and, you know, empower cities with, the, with kind of the tools, whether it be, um, you know, ballot stuff, polling. Um, technical assistance, whatever, to help cities do this kind of same thing because there's, you know, the lack of an infrastructure bill nationally. And then we kind of um, originally started this economic development vertical that, that I helped lead at Accelerator um, as Opportunity Zones passed. And so that was kind of really the, the catalyst for this conversation internally at Accelerator. And I joined soon after Accelerator um, has... Um, you know, a, a very close partner relationship with Bruce Katz, who is a past LPTV guest. Um, <laughs> so we, and that is what he's most distinguished for, of course, for having been on LPTV. Uh, <laughs> as well. um, and, uh, and so kind of started the Opportunity Zone work, which kind of broadened into this kind of community wealth thing to which you guys have already um, alluded on, on this show. And I think the past kind of two years, I've been, I've been an accelerator about, about two years, has been focusing on one, you know, um, you know, you mentioned capital and like, you know, uh, attracting and leveraging private, public, civic, philanthropic capital for the benefit of distressed communities in particular. And so that was obviously the conceit behind Opportunity Zones. In practice, it's hit or miss. And so our goal was to kind of help work with local leaders to figure this thing out and then deploy it properly. And so that was a significant part of the beginning of our work and still continues to be a, a, a part of it. Although now it's, you know, we've kind of broadened into you know, what are the other ways that people can leverage different types of capital to work on things like community wealth, different forms of ownership, all this kind of stuff that we're talking about now. And so that's, um, I think, a little preview. And then I guess the last thing that, that we're working on going forward is this kind of future of work plank, which, you know, for us isn't necessarily, I think the way that's used in, you know, in California and whatever is what happens when the robots come, you know, what, what you know, when everybody gets disintermediated from their jobs. From our perspective, it's more, how do we find sustainable career pathways for people? And I love the, the framing that you guys just used about, and you know, you guys use often about 
you know, llamas and, and being able to create agency and people with people in their communities. How do we find more sustainable pathways to those type of things? That's kind of the, our next phase or the next kind of plank of work with the support of the Kauffman Foundation, Kansas City. That's awesome. Um, and I'm excited to dig in and, and hopefully find ways to figure out, to collaborate on that. Um, one of the things that we have been commenting on, and I think you sort of are uh, alluding to it, is I think opportunity zones are useful uh, to highlight kind of um, the importance of community and place baking uh, around sort of elevating our communities and elevating wealth. What they haven't done is they're not necessarily the best tool for the job. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think one of the things we've been sort of talking through is we've got all these players um, and I think we've seen middling success in, in some places. And as you said, it's spotty, right? So one of the things that was brought up in a recent discussion was kind of the role CDFIs can play. Um, and I'd love to sort of hear from you how, how you think um, the CDFI plays in the, in the realm and what are the, some of the challenges there? Because I think they have a useful role to play, but I don't know that they're, they actually have the DNA to actually play it. Right. I would say two things in that regard. One is that I agree that they are super useful. And I think that not only are they super useful in many cases and places, they're the only forms of capital that are, are empowered to see these places, right? Which again, was the conceit of opportunities. And so one is that they're just not empowered enough. There just aren't enough of them and they don't have enough money. So, you know, our mutual friend, Alex Flaxbart is, is a great example of someone that kind of identifies the fact that there's not even really a CDFI focusing on the whole state of Alabama, right? Okay. Uh, and, you know, which, and you could probably extrapolate that to the broader South, et cetera, et cetera. So, so one, there aren't enough of them and they aren't particularly well capitalized or financed. And so that's a particular challenge. And then the second thing that we're talking about again with this conversation is that CDFIs traditionally focus on debt and not equity. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, debt is the vehicle for financing a ton of businesses. We understand it very well intuitively, et cetera, et cetera, which is a very important part of it. But one of the great conversations that has, either, you know, catalyzed opportunity zones and then has been catalyzed by the existence of opportunity zones is the, is the role that equity capital plays in uplift for, for communities, particularly given the fact that equity is, has been the vehicle for, for wealth accumulation in America for 150 years, you know? Um, and that it forces staff conversations about ownership, right? And, and, you know, the thing I think that opportunity zones have failed at, and this is switching the conversation a little bit, so I'll, I'll pause after this, but, uh, is enabling things to happen like what you all are doing at Launchpad and, and, and other initiatives that are focusing on businesses and people, right? Like we're very good at talking about place and opportunity zones are very focused on place because they're, you know, they're rigid and they're, you know, um, they're settled, but we don't do a good enough job just as a community or as a people or as a country or whatever and talking about the actual people in those places. And you guys, it seems, are very careful to, to have that conversation, which I really appreciate. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, for, for good or for bad, I mean, they are our people, <laughs> right? Which is, you know, we well, focus, uh, our, our business is a consumer business right. and we don't focus on the top of the pyramid, right? And um, we actually, we call it graduation at Launchpad, right? Which is people who are gonna go on to, you know, for example, one of our favorite, uh, one of our few unicorns, um, coming out of New Orleans, started with one desk at Launchpad, right? And he grabbed, but he graduated to a bigger office space as he started to build his company. And so we sort of look at it and sort of say, people have to graduate out of that, which actually gives us, and PPP did a really nice job of shining a light on a lot of the breakpoints in yep. the company. And Absolutely. what we really see is most of our members look a lot like us, not look a lot like us because of you know skin color or any of those things they look a lot like us which is like we're trying to make it work right and there's not there's not um huge vast amount of capital that are flying into llama companies or small businesses right. or you know the woman in memphis who wants to start her uh new e-commerce business right and that could be a lifestyle changing business for her but from a vc perspective it's uninteresting and yet at the same time for her to get herself off the thing, she's got excretive, ex extractive, sorry, extractive 
uh, financing options that are like revenue right. financing. And all of a sudden that's a very high cost and there's not equity capital there. And yep. yet I can come out of Stanford and Facebook and someone will write me a $500,000 check. Yep. So when that woman's business fails, right. Right. Her risk is she might actually lose her assets. I don't know. And yet if I'm, on the other side of the equity room at the top of the pyramid and I look like a unicorn, I can get all the equity financing that I want. And when my business goes off the rails, I can just start another business and I haven't lost anything. And yep. so it's like this, it is a really interesting thing is the tools are not being used um, fairly across the board. Yep. Absolutely. And it gets to a separate conversation about the tool, like which tools are available to whom. Right. And, uh, a, also a question of, and you guys alluded to this earlier before I joined, um, is a question, you know, we talk about this internally with, with my boss and with our organization, is like a lot of these things just go down to poverty, right? Like it's these self-perpetuating things, right? It's like the, the old joke is like the only people who end up getting free stuff are the people who don't need it, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're wealthy enough, people send you stuff and all this, you know, whatever. Yeah. It's like, these are the exact people that don't need stuff. And so when you look at like how capital flows into the places that need them versus the places that don't need them, it's perverse and really frustrating. I think when you kind of dig into it. Yeah. And it's, it's the other piece of that is it's about awareness and access. Right. And something that we talk about is um, a privilege is actually the exposure to things that other people don't have exposure to. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's one of the things that we want to address, right? I'm not, I'm not all of a sudden going to become a banker. Um, so what jobs can we do? And I think there's this gap, which is about entrepreneurship and the on-ramp there and working with folks like you guys and I think, oh, like, honestly, all of the work that's being done across everybody that we know in the opportunity zones world, it's not about opportunity zones. It's actually about sort of creating and filling the gaps for finance and capital strategy into these zones. Like none of us are doing this because we want to help a bunch of guys with a tax incentive. We're all focused on this because we want to use new tools to actually solve gaps of funding and create more wealth and, yep. and problems. And, Stephen, I'm so pumped that you're on today and you're Thank giving you. us a wealth of information. Of course he is. And the wealth of information is, is that a lot of people don't even know the tools that exist out there, right? Right. So our education point needs to be about exposing and uncovering. And you, uh, when Mark Morial was on, he made the comment, he was like, you got to put the jam on the lower shelves, right? We got to give people yeah. access to the True. tools that have been sort of held back by a lot of other folks. So, Aaron, I'm curious about if you if you have thoughts on this. Um, there, the, it seems like uh, this time the you know confluence of of you know multiple crisis crises uh, in the country. You know, we're sort of there's there's this you know sort of element of like you know staying alive and 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 sort of keeping our head above water. But if we can find the bandwidth for it, it's also a time for for the potential for big thinking. I mean, that's what you were sort of, you know, alluding to with, with Mark Morial, you know, he, he was sort of, you know, hey, there's, you know, somebody needs to create a new, new financial product that, that, you know, we can, we can get into these, you know, underserved communities. And, um, you know, do you see during this time, the potential, you know, if, you know, if we can navigate it in the political environment, I'm sure is going to, you know, be crazier and crazier as we approach the election in November. But um, are, is there the potential for, you know, for, for broad change in, in cities across America right now? I think there is. Um, and it's, the, it's, def it's desperation that creates that change, right? It's that catalyzes that is, is the need for ideas because we're not Whatever we've been doing hasn't been working for one. I think we've all recognized yeah. that. That's why we do the work that we do, one. And two, now we've got this whole new variable or set of variables that are completely, you know, have, have 
you know, blown up everything that we conceived of it before and we've got to figure out, and I think that we've learned that stuff that we did in the past from a, at least from a public policy perspective, it took us a long time to recover from the great recession, assuming that you recovered at all, right? You do your work in places often that haven't recovered. We try to do the same. And so now I think that we're, we're, I think we're starting to do a good job of learning lessons from the past about how we should be thinking about these things. One is that we are doing continually a better job of, of rejecting trickle down. Right, we've always kind of like implicitly, even you know, on on both sides of the aisle. I don't want to obviously politicize that, but like, you know, there's always this understanding of, well, hey, once you know, if we invest in this place and you know, if you bring in this company or whatever, that it's going to eventually help these people. When it's really like, it ends up helping the people who get the tax incentive, and it helps people, you know, and it helps the few people, and and there are certainly people that are helped, but I think that it ends up hurting a lot of those people. And now we're getting better at saying, how do we focus on the fortunes of those people in particular? So even yeah. talking about things like ownership and, and wealth accumulation, whatever, it's not for, I don't, you know, and, 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 and I think we've laughed about this off, off, off the record, but it's like, I don't care how, many, how much rich people get richer if we're actually doing things that like help people accumulate wealth from, you know, who have who've been precluded from it beforehand, right? Um, and so to answer the direct question about, about big ideas, I think that there's a lot of room for big, you know, imagine, a year ago, five years ago, whatever, a Republican president and Republican Senate doing the things that we've done, even, you know, in the in, in imperfect as they may be from a, um, you know, federal legislation perspective. So I think that there's room that the desperation has created room for innovation around that kind of stuff, the things that the Fed's doing in relation to how they, they, they deal with Main Street businesses right now, even if it's kind of failed to, to meet the places that that we um you know, that we'd like them to see. So the room for innovation there. And then I think the city version and the stuff that we really care about and find is interesting is awesome in that regard, the way that we're talking about these things. So one, this has forced us to think more, you know, Mayor Tubbs, who, who is, is, is a great friend of yours, is, you know, has been doing the, um, the UBI or GBI pilot in Stockton. And now Mayor Garcetti and I think nine other mayors have signed. I know, I saw that. In their cities, right? Because like, you know, it, it, I think that it, it speeds up these conversations. And then from our perspective, I think from like the things that city leaders can be doing that are grand or different ideas that this is catalyzed, things like, you know, the things that I'm excited over, like community trusts and neighborhood REITs and all these things that directly focus on how do you foster ownership, uh, particularly equity ownership for people that don't have the disposable income or have been precluded from doing so now. And so stuff like that, I think are really cool ideas and figuring out like, you know, there's a, there's something called the North Kensington Community, Tr or the North Kensington, the Kensington Corridor Trust in North Philadelphia um, that is focused on just doing that, right? Which is taking philanthropic and some private capital, accumulating assets, and then putting them in a trust that in a way that they accumulate to the community and continues to perpetuate income over time. And then eventually, and this is my hope for them, is that those things and th those assets, whether they be real estate or otherwise, are going to eventually be spitting off cash. And that's cash that's going to accrue directly to the community instead of this kind of trickle down thing that, that you know, I think we're starting to finally reject. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. awesome. And Stephen, I see you're adding a whole bunch of uh, comments in this. We'll, we'll certainly recap those for uh, the follow up, but I'm, I'm, I'm learning from Aaron and Stephen at the same time. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Perfect for my ADHD. Yeah. Like I'm more engaged than ever. But um, I, Aaron, I think I mean I think you're right that the sort of the notion of trickle down, you know, it, and and it's applied in in so many different ways. Um, whether it's you know economic development incentives that are spent to recruit, you know, Amazon HQ2 or you know anything else. Um, you know the the notion maybe bygone now that the the opening up the Indian casino was going to create all these jobs and wealth where it really, yeah. you know, you know, destroyed communities. Um, you know, even, even to the point of like, you know, the, the disconnect between the stock market and the economy right now, you know, the stock market keeps going up, you know, you know, it's the holders of capital uh, that are, that are, that are benefiting from that. But, you know, you know, general Americans are, are, are not necessarily invested in the stock market and, it, and it's complete disconnect between what, what everybody is experiencing and expecting to come out of COVID and, you know, you know where, where some of these gains are going. So, you know, I, I think, you know, circling back to sort of your, your discussion, the topic of the future of work, one mm -hmm. of the things that we feel 
strongly about is, you know, as automation, you know, Andrew Yang's thing or, you know, w whatever it is starts, you know, destroying jobs, but there's also new dynamics like, you know, what we're doing right now, you know, the ability to work remotely, you know, you don't have to move to the Bay Area for a job. You can, you know, live where you grew up in Memphis and, and you know, get, it, get a great education and go work for, you know, Facebook, it, but, but never leave Memphis. Um, what do you what do you see as some of these you know dynamics? I'm not sure that you picked the two best examples, Facebook and but <laughs> <laughs> you might not want to work for Facebook, but um, you know yeah uh, no. But I, I mean, what are some of the things as you're as you sort of you know you know, are trying to sort of you know think about the future of work and um, how. You know, people are, we describe it at Launchpad as working entrepreneurially. That may mean starting a business, but it also means just expanding your, your view of how you're working to an agency in your life. You're, you're doing what you want to do every day versus going in and, you know, having a bunch of clocks somewhere, that kind of yep. thing. Well, I think the word agency is the key there. And I love that you guys said it because I don't think I would have put it exactly that way. And that's exactly the point, which is like having ownership over your own life and including, you know, the assets and stuff like that, which is that we all work for somebody, right? Whether it's investors and this, that, and the other thing, but the idea of like being able to control your life in a way that is fulfilling and provides dignity, right? And, and right. so- the way that I think that we have thought about it and, and the way that we're thinking about it going forward and the things that we are excited to kind of promote and kind of start start to, to build and scale across the country. So again, in Philly, there's, there's uh, so Shift Capital is a, an impact developer in Philly that we've gotten very close with. So, you know, they've been leading the Kensington Cor Corridor Trust. And so we've gotten to know them really well. There's another thing called, um, it's called Jumpstart Germantown in, in Philly. And what it does is it helps train people to be real estate developers. And the oh. thing that I like about that is that we are using, or this kind of idea is using the same tools we've used for generations, right? And it's, you know, to the point that you both just made is that like, it's a difference between capital and labor, right? How do we get laborers to start thinking about capital? Because that's the, the path to prosperity in America for better, or for worse, for worse, I believe. Um, and so how do you think about training people with the skills to, we're, we're always going to, you know, California of all places has a massive housing crisis and we need to, you know, and, and, and supply crunch is an issue. And so how do we democratize the tools that have always been used by people like privileged people come from privileged backgrounds like that I do to accumulate capital and, and, and access, you know, prosperity? How do we make sure those things that exist still, um, you know, th th that you have other people, um, you know, able to access them? So I think that's kind of how we think about future of work stuff is how do we make sure not that we are tracking kids in, in, in poor neighborhoods because we, we know how much that fails as well, but how do we make sure that people are getting, you know, they call it at the Coffin Foundation, they call it real world learning, but stuff that like you find ways to give people access to skills and careers and opportunities and options that everybody else already gets, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so when, again, when it's the stuff that you're doing, it's focusing on giving people agency that like, we're not building, it, it doesn't have to be the next Facebook or whatever it is, but you're giving people a place that like, you know, it's access and agency, which is like a network and technical assistance and training opportunities, all these things that all these hyper privileged places get and give that we don't really talk about in assessing other people's success and how many times that their hand was held, how many times my hand was held. And so for you, you guys creating these kind of structures and spaces. And that I think is what we're trying to see more of because those transcend place in direct location, all that kind of stuff, especially in this new economy, right? That like finding, you know, there's going to be more of these things. I imagine there's going to be more of these cohorts or communities that are online or whatever, but they're still just as useful for these people, regardless of whether you are working for, I don't know, whatever a big, big, big tech company in Silicon Valley, that's not Facebook is in Memphis or in New Orleans or in Newark or whatever these things are finding ways to, to, to give people access to those things that everybody else already has. Yeah, I love that you talked about Shift. Um, we've been looking at projects with them, trying to find something to do together in Philly. Um, so what they're doing over there is, is really great. Talk to us a little bit about what I love about your model is I think that the power of mayors and city leaders to actually be able to have real impact on the ground is much, much greater than, you know, the nation. It's also uh, not 
consistent that everybody does a great job of it. But um, can you give us a, a few examples of some of the cities that sort of are, are leading the charge in terms of being really thoughtful and proactive about this kind of stuff? Of course. I mean, so it's cool. One of the one of the wonderful learning experiences for me in this job, which is, just been, you know, it's been almost like a, a second grad school experience for me and, and being able to go to places and, and see places and dynamics and economies that like I don't come from. I'm from Los Angeles and lived in New York City and then the big, you know, it's like, and so as a, you know, dumb coastal kid being able to go to a lot of places that don't have that and see local leaders that are inspiring and, you know, the, the way that, that Bruce always kind of talks about who he picks with whom he works is in, you know, this is, I guess, you know, uh, candidly, like leaders with a pulse, right? And, and so I've seen that there are so many places and I find frustrating that people have been failed. And then there are so many places where people like, that is so the difference in local leadership is, is active, exciting, motivated local leadership. And there's this cool generation of people. So because of our, you know, our, our friendship and like, I think Mayor Tubbs is a great example, right? To start of someone that like is, you know, he was like, he saw your model and what you guys have been doing across the country. And then like, you guys work together to bring that to Stockton, right? And that's yeah. like an example of, you know, and he's the person that always wants to try, like, whatever the new thing is that's exciting, come do it in Stockton. And I think that is a really, so he was, you know, they were on the cutting edge of opportunity zones. Um, when you think about labor and skills and, you know, entrepreneurship and all that kind of stuff with you guys' partnership with, you know, the UBI, GBI thing, learning lessons from that, being a leader from a place like Stockton, which is not a, you know, top tier or first tier city or whatever. And so I think he's a great example. And there's this, this just kind of like young cohort of, of these young local leaders who have really bright futures. Um, Mayor Woodfin in Birmingham is another great example, right? Mm -hmm. Aided by, you know, Josh Carpenter and his, his office who's, you know, this brilliant, hardworking, hard ass who is like pushing all this stuff through our friend Alex who's the same way, this like, kind of like that, so that ecosystem of like Birmingham and Alabama with those people working together on like, that, that I think has become the model in many ways for the rest of the country in that regard. Um, Nan Whaley in, in Dayton, Ohio is, is you know, has now become like a, a personal close friend, but she, I think she is the person that I admire the most of our, of, of the people that we work with because she spit fire um, and unrelenting and passionate on behalf of the people for whom she works, right? And she is, you know, we went to Dayton, I've been to Dayton a couple times now, and like, I didn't know, and again, these are things that I'm learning in my second grad school, is like, Dayton is 43% black, right? And so, just as in every other city in America, there's like this, whatever the dividing line of race is, and, and for them, it's the river, I think it's the Ohio River, um, that on the west side of Dayton is the, is the, you know, the black part of Dayton. And so her whole thing is like, she is talking directly about what do we do in this place to benefit these people? Not in a way that's like, let's just bring anything to Dayton and hope it works for poor people. And if it doesn't, oh, well, I've got my ribbon cutting ceremony. And you're seeing that I think from, from these wonderful examples of local leaders. I mean, you know, uh, Anna Valencia is the city clerk of the city of Chicago. And she's been really focused on the west side of Chicago, which is kind of big city and, you know, whatever. But it's the, again, there's the, you know, there is the dividing line. I think the street is Western on, and, and west of Western um, in Chicago is the same kind of story that you see in all these other places. And so really focusing passionately on these particular people. Um, Mayor Garcetti is the chair of our board and he is someone, you know, whom I greatly admire and, and have gotten to know really well and I'm really excited about. It. And so when you think about even being innovative on stuff that they want to be the first one, one, they signed on to, you know, Mayor Garcetti signed on to Mayor Tubbs' thing. But when we talk about how do we reform criminal justice or defund criminal, you know, whatever these phrases are, he's like, all right, well, whatever it is, let's try it in LA, you know, and this is the second biggest yeah. thing and all that kind of stuff. And I really love that. So I think that we're seeing, and, you know, thank God for people like Bruce and Rick, my boss, and all in and, and the work that you guys are doing in giving these people resources to work with. I think that's how we see our role is like, here are these awesome, this, this vanguard of local leaders that really want to just try new shit, excuse my language, right? Like they want to just do really cool, interesting stuff for the people that live, you know, where they live. And it's our goal, I think, as an ecosystem to provide them stuff to try and see and like, you know, whether it's ideas or, um, or you know, institutions and platforms like the one you guys have. I think it's, it's, um, it's really, really inspiring and really cool. I think it, one last great example is like, uh, I don't know if you guys have met Quentin, but Quentin Hart is the mayor of Waterloo, Iowa, which is the blackest city in Iowa. The, I think he's the first black mayor, not many black mayors in the state of Iowa, but it's 20% black. It was a great migration city. 
post-industrial, you know, John Deere is headquartered there, the jobs and all that kind of stuff. And so he's been sitting and working on bringing national, in the same way that Mayor Tubbs has done, like bringing national presence to Waterloo and saying, you know, the big project right now is, the, is a grocery store in a food desert. And it's the most like basic idea that people need access to healthy food, but they haven't had it for generations, basically since the King riots in 68. Um, and so he's, you know, we've been able to work with him and bring in all these different resources, whether they be WSP from a technical assistance and in, in engineering perspective, um, and also some financial modeling. And, you know, we had an investor summit, we had a presidential debate in Waterloo, Iowa, all this kind of stuff. And so seeing those people bringing a national presence to their place, but not for the pretty new development thing, it's for the thing that actually helps people, you know, and I think Woodfin, I think Tubbs, I think, you know, um, you know, Mayor Hart, and it's interesting, these are all young black mayors, which I think, you know, the mayor of, of Richmond, all these, and I, one last interesting point that we've seen is that one thing that's really exciting, especially during this time, is that all these former Confederate cities, Montgomery, Alabama, you know, Birmingham's a little different because it barely existed at the time, Richmond, which was this, you know, Richmond, Virginia, which was the seat of, seat of the Confederacy, now all, yeah. the, all these awesome young black leaders who were like really focused on like, the black communities that have been so far, you know, or, or for so long left behind, ignored, disinvested, all those kind of things. And now these leaders are really focused on specifically those places. And I love it. Yeah, it is interesting that, to, to see that leadership. And, and as you were referencing it, it's sort of a kind of a bright spot to see that, you know, that le local leadership <laughs> and, um, you know, in, 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 a, in a time where it's pretty easy to be disenchanted yeah. you know, from a political standpoint about what's going on on the national stage. Yeah. Um, everybody you just mentioned, you know, the, the, the solutions that, that, that are going to, you know, take the country forward are, are going to, are going to rise up, you know, from local experiments, local initiative, you know, that, that, uh, le leaders with a pulse, uh, like you said, like Bruce Katz yeah. says. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Well, Aaron, uh, we are almost at time. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what's next for Accelerator for the Mer America and what you are excited about as we hit the summer of 2020? Man. Uh, well, Accelerator. So one of the one of the things that I think Paige is is, is potentially watching and she um, for Accelerator has has led along with our, our, our colleague, Justin, an effort in Los Angeles that you know Rick came up with and was seated in, in the in, in the city, which was called the Angelino Card, and it was the idea that um, federal stimulus money had not hit a lot of places and PPP had not hit a lot of you know places and businesses, and so the the economic catastrophe that is Corona um, disproportionately affected people who then haven't been able to receive help, and so they raised, including the mayor you know, over $50 million, they've already given out, I think nearly $40 million at this point in MasterCard debit cards to people, just giving just giving people money because they really need it. And so that's something that we've been really proud of at Accelerator with Rick and Paige and Justin's leadership along with Youssef and, and you know, folks in the, at the Mayor's Fund. So that's, we're, we're continuing. So our next step, we had a call this morning, we're scaling that um, to 10 cities nationally, right? The, and, I saw and so that, that's amazing. From the Society Foundation. And so that idea that right now we just need more opportunities to give people help, we're really proud of that. Um, we're working with Bruce on what a recovery playbook for cities should look like, including in, in MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, who's our, who's our big supporter as well, on how do we give cities an actual toolkit? Great, we've been really focused on recovery. We did small business recovery fund stuff. We've done the Angelino card, which is our, sorry, that's rescue. Um, we've done the Angelino card, which is again, like rescue and hope, you know, I think we're going to continue to do more in that regard because people just need money. And now I think the next thing is how do we recover from this from, from the years to come? So we're really excited to be working on that. Um, the thing that I, the, the, and I guess the last point, cause I know we're up to time is the thing that I am personally really excited about is this moment that we've seen as a country that it's, you know, what do they say? Like some history happens in days, right? Like the, the, or, you know, years of history can happen in days. In the last six weeks and two months and whatever that we've seen from a racial equity perspective, um, from a focus on, you know, the most vulnerable among us perspective, I'm really, really excited to see what comes of this over the next couple of months. And it may, like, those are the things that in a really ugly, gross, infuriating time to be an American still make me really proud and excited that shit like this can happen here. Yeah. Yeah, it, it feels like um, we're in a we're in a pivotal point in the in the country's history 
um, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is is the largest movement in in the country's history, right? That's amazing, and and to to you know, you kind of wonder if if we all hadn't been pushed to this breaking point, um, would it have galvanized the the country the way it has? Right? There is a a slight, you know, that would be actually a great silver lining, right? Not just a slight silver, but there would be yeah. okay, it's a period of change of, of, uh, of, of, you know, extreme, you know, uh, adversity that people are facing right now. Um, there is some, there is some change happening in this country and, and we need to lock, lock that in and, and keep it headed in the right direction. Can I say I mean, one thing? Think... Let's kick me out. Yeah. Um, you like, I just want to note for the audience, whoever's watching or how many people watching that, like, the energy that you guys bring to every single thing that we've gone to together is like, I am very honored that you, that you would have me on the show and what you guys have done in the past and what you guys are building toward. Like, it's been really, really cool for us and for me to be a part of. And it's just fun. Like even what, like it's been, it was my favorite part of this conversation was watching you guys before I got on because one, <laughs> what you guys have together, but just this, this whole, like the spirit of the show and that you guys bring this stuff. I mean, you know, and like you're the, you're the star of every panel you've ever been on. And I, I hope whoever's watching has an opportunity to continue to see that. So thank you for having me. There we go. Thank you so much for that. that that's a good way to go back on vacation for the rest I know, of the week. I know. I do feel that this time that we don't have any, we shouldn't be taking vacation. There's too much work to do. But uh, you got to take, take, oh, you got to get your, off. you got to take care of yourself. If that cup is empty, you can't do anything for anybody else. You know? um, Aaron, we are, uh, I have met you, I do think, I feel like I've met you every quarter for this year. Yep. Um, we have been trying to figure out a way of working together, and I promise you that we are going to, we got it. We got some, I got, I got some, we're cooking something up, so we, uh, we look forward to it, um, and, and we're grateful for your leadership. In times like this, those of us on the small business side, uh, we spend a lot of our days trying to figure out how to stay alive, um, and you guys are thinking a lot about how to build a future for us, and we're we're grateful for that work, um, and it's important work, and it's uh, it's the thing that's going to keep us going. Yeah. So, I, why would so we not me. end with that? I mean, yeah. my God, you can come on uh, any day. Most things will get to the morning. Give you. me a pep talk. <laughs> so. Uh, thank you to Aaron Thomas of Accelerator for America today. It has been a pleasure to have him on. Uh, we're excited to have him back to talk about all the great work that we've done. Um, next up, next week, we are doing, in lieu of the show, and a big announcement. Oh, uh, yeah, next Tuesday. Virtual press conference on a new Launchpad location coming to a city near you. Uh, and then we're going to be meeting with our friend Brent from New Orleans Launchpad, a graduate and a former member, but always a member in our hearts, uh, to talk about his new endeavors and some of the work that Revelry is doing to inspire entrepreneurship in New Orleans. All right. So we'll see you Thanks, next Aaron. Week. Thanks, Thank Aaron. you for having me. Thanks, everybody. Bye.